right, how are we doing today, everybody? It is uh, almost Christmas time, as we just said. I was, uh, I was in our Amazon account last night looking for the last minute gifts, and you know you're cutting it close when even Amazon is like, I don't know if I can guarantee it's gonna be here before Christmas. So that was, that was like the sounding alarm for me. It's like, oh man, I gotta get my stuff together here. Um, you know, Christmas is, is, uh, Christmas is awesome. It's that time of year. Um, where it always reminds me of this this story though with my wife uh, from from several years ago. We have a our oldest is eight years old now, and um, back then my wife was pregnant. You know, kind of like Mary pregnant, getting to that point where it's like eight months pregnant, and uh, life you know circumstances in life kind of changed on us in, in a dime. And uh, there was this thing where where I needed to find a, a job. I was like job hunting. And my wife was like seven months pregnant, eight months pregnant. And uh, and how many of you can imagine? That's probably pretty stressful, right? Trying to find a, a job when you're when your uh, wife is that pregnant. And uh, I found one, uh, and it was a couple of states away. So it was like a four-hour ride from where we were living. And we had to hop in the, the vehicle and go check it out, right? Because you're not just going to move blindly four hours away. You want to check it out. You're looking for houses. You're looking for all this stuff. We're looking for a place to, to stay and to rent out there. And uh, as time kind of crept on and crept on, my wife Andrea was like eight months eight months pregnant. And, uh, you know, sometimes sometimes... Look, I'm a, I'm a guy. Let's be real. I'm a guy. I don't even really barely know what I'm talking about when it comes to pregnancy stuff. But but I have heard tell that some for some women, like pregnancy, even up to the nine months is like, oh, it's like a walk in the park. I'm pregnant. I'm nine months. This is great. I'm, you know, enjoy every last drop of this. And there's other women, they get to like seven or eight months and they're like, dear God, this thing, I can't wait. And my wife, my wife... <laughs> My wife was was maybe uh, the the latter, right? She she was she was getting to that point where she was like eight months, and so and it wasn't her fault. I mean, she was at a point where she couldn't, she, for for comfort's sake, she couldn't drive the vehicle anymore. She couldn't drive a car. She was eight months, you know. She got the belly, so so we were driving out there to to a couple states away, four hours, and and she had to lay down in the passenger seat because she couldn't sit up. She had to lay down. But then she had like intense sciatica, which is apparently a thing for, for pregnant ladies. So she couldn't find a place to get comfortable. So then she had a pillow. She was laying on her side for like four hours. And every bump that we hit, every turn that I made was like jostling her around. And it was just super uncomfortable for that poor woman. And she told me something that, that changed my mind a little bit and like opened my eyes. And she said, babe, I can't imagine how Mary did it. Right? Was she, was she on a donkey? Like, how, like, can you imagine a, a woman that pregnant sitting side saddle on a donkey going through? It, it's not like they had a highway, right? It's not like this was super paved roads. It wasn't like you're in a car like you are today with shock absorbers. I don't know that donkeys have shock, absor shock absorbers. And I know in the, in the, it's kind of one of, those, one of these things that is in the popular imagination. It actually doesn't say anywhere in any of the Bible stories that she was on a donkey. But I don't think it really matters what she rode or how she got there. I can't imagine her being eight months pregnant or whatever, like walking 70 miles from Nazareth to, to Bethlehem, because that's how far it was. And that's as the crow flies, 70 miles. So in reality, they're going up through hills, they're going around, they're winding. It's probably more like 80 or so miles. And it don't matter whether it was on a donkey, on foot, in the back of a horse cart or something. The moral of the story is that it was difficult for that woman, for sure. It was difficult for that woman. So every time I, I open the, the word and it gets to be this time of year and we, we start reading through these stories again, you know, the, the way in the manger stories kind of a thing, I always remember what my wife told me that time. She's like, I can't imagine how Mary did it. It must have been very, very difficult. And I guess that kind of brings me to my, my next point here is that, you know, sometimes we read these stories like over and over and over again. It's like every time of year, like clockwork, December comes and we start talking about the manger, start talking about the star, start talking about all this stuff. And sometimes it gets to the point where it's like, yeah, yeah, even for me, yeah, I've heard it before, man. Like, you're not going to tell me nothing new. Like, I get it. Yep, yep, yep. This whole thing, the manger and all this stuff. But when I find in my life that I kind of am getting like that to the point where, where I'm almost not taking the time to listen and read and, and remember and understand the importance of what that event was all about. So we're going to take a little bit of time today uh, delving into some of these nativity stories, and we're going to see really what it says. And I want to take some time. I want to open my heart here, maybe open our hearts to this, because maybe God's going to show us a little something new. Amen. So let's pick it up here in Matthew chapter 1. It is the very first chapter in your New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. It says this. It says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but, because the, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, 
She became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiance, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. So I got a, a question here off the bat. Like, I try to put myself in, in, uh, in Joseph's shoes a little bit, and I try to think, like, how receptive would I be to my fiance coming to me pregnant? And I know I didn't, I didn't do it. <laughs> and she comes to me and she starts telling me like, oh, no, no, don't worry. It wasn't another man. It was actually like God, the, the Holy Spirit and all this stuff. I don't, I don't know that Joseph was super receptive, right, in that moment. And I don't know that I can blame him. And we know that he probably wasn't uh, super receptive to that because it says right there that he was thinking to, to, to break off the engagement quietly. Like, who's going to believe that? The story starts with a miracle, right? And sometimes miracles are hard to believe. They're supernatural for a reason. They happen beyond nature. It's supernatural. So he had a hard time believing that. And he was like, okay, I don't think so. Can you imagine like the emotions that come? Maybe you've experienced emotions like that where like you were with somebody or somebody did something, they stabbed you in the back, they betrayed you. They took your trust in their hands and they snapped it in half and gave you some dumb little excuse that was just totally a transparent excuse. And you're supposed to sit there and eat that and be like, uh-huh, okay, yeah. There were emotions involved in that when Joseph heard those words. I guarantee you there was emotions. And he had options. To be a fly on the wall during that conversation where Mary was trying to explain to Joseph where the baby really came from. At first, Joseph was like, mm-hmm, okay, yeah. And he had options as far as that, that, that world went and that culture and that society. He had a couple of different options. It says that he chose not to publicly shame her, to, to break the engagement quietly. Well, what he could have done is made a public spectacle of it and been like, this woman right here, this one who I gave my heart to, I gave my life to, I thought we were going to be together forever. I thought that she was going to be faithful. I gave her my heart, and this woman went away and did this thing to me. And he could tell everybody in town, and they were real interested in people's business back then. It wasn't, it wasn't just like today where it's like, okay, that happened, and maybe there's a little bit of a mark on somebody for it, unfortunately. Like back then, it was like you could be outcast of society. Like everywhere you went, you carried that with you and they knew who you were and they talked about you when you walked into a room. And one of the other options that he had, when, if he had wanted to publicly shame her, it would not have just affected her. It would have affected the baby as well. Because in the Hebrew culture, a baby born out of that situation is what they call a mamzer. A mamzer was actually someone who was marked for life. So you'd be born as a baby and something beyond your control had caused you to be conceived and you're born and there's no mercy for you. You were born into sin and you carried that mark with you your whole life and you weren't even allowed to be a part of the temple business because you were so marked. Joseph had that option. One of the other options, even crazier, is that according to the law, Joseph could have really pushed his rights and said, I do not forgive this woman. I want to go ahead and take this to the extent of the law, which was actually stoning her to death. We see this in a later story with Jesus. The Pharisees are trying to catch Jesus in a trap, so they bring a woman caught in adultery right before Jesus, and they say, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? Because they, they want to see, are we going to stone this woman? That's what the law says. And Jesus famously says, hey, Listen, guys, let them without sin cast the first stone. But it was the same kind of situation. Mary could have been at the front end of all those guys with stones in their hands if Joseph had really pushed his rights. But he chose something. He didn't want to mark her. He didn't want to publicly disgrace her. He didn't want to mark that child's life from birth he didn't want to execute her. He chose to deal with it quietly. Joseph chose mercy over judgment. He had her dead to rights, as we would say. You hurt me. You betrayed me. And you know it's the human, the human heart, the human condition. When you get hurt, you want to hurt back, right? It's real easy to take a wound and make the fist. And Joseph, I'm sure... 
in his heart wanted revenge and he was weighing it out and he had his fists clenched maybe and he was like, you know what? I surrender those clenched fists. I surrender. I choose mercy over judgment. Maybe some of you have been cheated or lied to or stabbed in the back. Maybe that's a word for some of you. Maybe we need to take our fists and turn them into surrender and say, you know what? What you did to me is unacceptable. I forgive you for it. Maybe I'm not going to forget, but I choose to forgive you for it. God's going to work it out. So the story goes on, verse 20 and 21, as he's considering this, right? He's considering this. He's going to let her go quietly. As he's considering this, guess what happens to Joseph? Surprise, surprise, an angel shows up and appears to him in a dream. I bet he was not expecting that. (laughs) He's like, wait, this is real? Like that story she told me, that's real? The angel shows up and said, it's real. Joseph, son of David, the angel says, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. And I have another question. When I read this story and I really kind of try to put myself into Joseph's shoes, Do I think, even if I had a dream where like an angel came to me, like, is that going to make a whole lot of sense to me? Am I going to be able to to really understand what is going on? Yes, I understand it was an angel. Yes, now I can kind of see like what the angel is telling me is true. But I'm sure he sat on his bed for like days afterwards and was just being like, what does this mean? What is this about? I don't understand what's going on. And I think it would have been natural of a person, a guy like Joseph, to be, to be wondering like, like what? this was not the way that I planned it. I was getting married to this woman. This was, she was going to be my wife. We're going to go off together. We're going to get married. We're going to have children in our own time. We're going to do all this stuff according to our plans. And this is certainly outside of our plans. I'm sure he struggled with that a little bit. Like what is really going on here? This wasn't the plan. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. This wasn't the way that I thought it was going to be. And I, and I see that in my own life. Like, I'm sure you guys have had plans that you made and things that you, you had going on, and now all of a sudden it takes a hot left turn, and you're like, that came out of nowhere. I, I, I wasn't expecting that. It's like some of you guys know my story. I'm not going to get super into it, but uh, there was a time when I was like 20 years old that I ended up on the streets. But uh, I was actually from Connecticut. Like, I was from a middle-class suburb in Connecticut, and I ended up on the street sleeping behind a dumpster in a parking lot in Phoenix, Arizona, when I was 20 years old. And you know what my friends from Connecticut were doing when they were 20 years old? They weren't sleeping behind dumpsters, man. They were going to Quinnipiac. They were going to Castleton up in Vermont. They were all doing their thing. What happened in my life is all of a sudden it took this crazy, unexpected left turn, and I wish that I knew the Lord back then so that I could have done what Joseph does in this story. You see, Joseph is trusting in the Lord even when it doesn't make sense. You see, when our plans get shaken and flipped upside, this is life, right? This is life. Nothing ever goes according to plan, our plan completely. Maybe your plan was to to have this job or make this amount of money or have this house or or be married and, and live happily ever after. That was the plan. That's the way that it was supposed to be. That's what we were looking for. That's what I was betting my life on. I gave my life to this person and it didn't work out. What do I do? We got to do what Joseph did. We got to trust that even though this is not what we expected, that God still knows what we're going through, that he's still in control. We got to trust God even when it doesn't make sense. We got to trust that God is still God and he's still with you no matter what you're going through. That's what Joseph and Mary were doing. They were trusting their lives. They were surrendering even their plans to a God that they knew they were still in his hands. So they surrendered the plans that they had and they said, Lord, have your way. Let it be as you say, God. Maybe we can do that today. One of the other places that it has the nativity story in the Bible is Luke, right? So Luke chapter two. Let's go ahead and read this. And uh, Luke, at that time, the Roman emperor Augustus, this is like a little history dork note here for anybody who has nothing to do with my message. Augustus is the same guy who defeated Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. Now, don't I feel smart that I knew that? Actually, I read it yesterday. Uh, so 
at that time of that particular emperor, he called a census, right? He called a census. So that means that everybody in verse 3, all the people returned to their own ancestral towns. Verse 3 there. Yep, all, all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. That was David's ancient home. So Joseph's family was from Bethlehem. He no longer lived in Bethlehem, but his family was originally from Bethlehem. So he had to travel all the way back to Bethlehem and, Bethlehem, and he took his obviously, it says, obviously pregnant wife. She wasn't just a little bit pregnant, guys. She was obviously pregnant. And it goes on, it says, and while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in the manger because there was no lodging available for them. Now, people all the time, they like to, to kind of fight over a couple of these details here. Was, was, was he, did he go to a hotel? Was it an inn? And they said there's no room in the inn. Was it, was it in a relative's house because his family was from that town? Was it a relative's house and there was no room in the house? Where exactly was this manger? Was it in a cave? Was it in a stall? Was it in a barn? Was it in the, the basement floor of, of, of a poor couple's house? And I think people can, can kind of squabble over that however they want to, but one of the details that doesn't change is that he was placed in the manger. He was placed in this thing that was a feeding trough for animals. So whether it was a stall, a barn, inside somebody's private house, because back then poor people would bring their animals into their house at night, wherever it was, he was placed into an animal's feeding trough. And I don't know if you have animals at home, but one of the things that I've learned over the years, I got, we got chickens this year, we got nine chickens uh, we had 10. Miraculously, nine of them have survived. <laughs> sorry, number 10. That was my bad. <laughs> so, I didn't do anything wrong. I fox got it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Full confession. <laughs> but whatever you do, whenever you have animals, right? And, and it's not like, not like my chickens stink terribly. It's not like they just stink up the place. But I will clean that, that coop often. I'm cleaning that coop often, but there's always going to be like a smell, like an animal smell. And a lot of you probably know what that animal smell is. You can just tell there's animals that do their business here whenever you're in a place like that. So it doesn't matter really where Jesus was particularly. It matters that he was in a feeding trough. And I'm sure it probably didn't smell great because that's where the animals would hang out. It's not a place fit for a baby. It's kind of the moral of the story much less fit for a king. Now, much, much less for the king of the universe who created the heavens and the earth to be born in the form of a baby, helpless baby child and be placed into an animal trough in a place that don't smell right, it don't look right, it doesn't seem like it's a place fit for a king. But why would he choose to be born there? If he's the God of heaven and earth and he created all this stuff, why would he allow himself to be placed in such a lowly place? It's because, because Christ chose to be born lowly. He did it on purpose. He did it on purpose. The high became low, humbled himself on purpose. We see that in Philippians 2. It says, Christ who being in very nature God. He was in nature God. That was part of his nature. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Made himself nothing. The Greek there is that he emptied himself of his divine privileges. He checked all that stuff at the door when he entered into this world. He emptied himself of his divine privileges. And it says that he made himself the very, took on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, emptied himself of those divine privileges. The high became low. He humbled himself and became low on purpose. Maybe there's a, a little bit of a better way to explain it. So I'm going to try and bring in one more gospel that has a little bit of a nativity story to it. And I got to warn you, like this is by a guy, it's by John. And John is a little bit different than the other guys, right? The, the, uh, the apostle John. John. John loves the mystery. He's got, he's got like a flair for the, for the mystery of God. And so his, his nativity story, when he talks about it, it's actually very easy to miss. It's like, wait, that was the nativity he was talking about? And he actually starts off with it in the first verse of his book. 
The very first book, very first verse of the book of John says this. It says, in the beginning. Now, many of you might know that there's only one other book in the Bible that starts with in the beginning, and that's Genesis. That's the beginning, the beginning. John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word, what was God? He was with God in the beginning. It says, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. It goes on in verse 4 and 5. It says, that in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So John is purposely shouting out, Genesis 1, he's doing a big comparison. He's saying Jesus is the word, and that same word in the beginning is that same word from back there in the beginning in Genesis, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering above the waters, and God said by the word, what did he say? Let there be light. And that was Jesus, the word in that moment, because everything was created through him. He was the one saying, let there be light, because he was God, with God in the beginning. He was there. He was in nature God. That same one that spoke the first words of existence and said, let there be light, is the same God, the same word that John says in verse 14. That word became flesh. I made his dwelling among us. It's the nativity story. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. The word from the beginning, the one who created the heavens and the earth. What did it say before? It said nothing was made except through him. He made it all. And that same one with all that power and all that glory and all that majesty, the one who can just still the storms of the sea, stop the raging waves with a word, be still. The sea was like, I. That same power, that same dominion and authority, that same glory is that same one that humbled himself to come in the form of a lowly little baby being born in a feed trough. Why? Why? Why would that God with that power do that? And my wife was reminding me of this, this, this story. I actually told this story the other day. We got married, and uh, we got married in, in Hawaii, right? Which, which uh, we actually lived there for a while, which sounds much fancier than it really is. It was not all that fancy. Um, but we lived in Hawaii. We lived there for like four years, and we, we ended up getting married there. And... Um, I got to tell you a little something about Hawaii is that, that on the big island where we were, there's really like nothing to do. After, after about 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock at night, like everything closes. There's not much on the island. It's almost like living on the island of Cheshire, Connecticut, and there's nowhere to go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, it's true. It's true. There was like nothing to do. So the only thing that there was to do was the ocean. And of course, the ocean's amazing and it's beautiful and stuff. But every day you open your door like, all right, time for another. You open it. The, there's the ocean. And to live there and to like living there and love living there, you have to be absolutely in love with the ocean because it's all there is. So when we were there, we spent like four years there. We had just gotten married. We, I think we were married for two months. And uh, one of the things that, that I learned how to do while I was there, I'd go with my buddies. We'd go um, scuba diving. And this one particular day, um, oh, and another note about, about the Big Island of Hawaii in particular, like when you think Hawaii, you're thinking, oh, sandy beaches, and it must be all like beautiful all the time. Actually, the Big Island is made of volcanic rock. So there's not a lot of sandy beaches. They actually import their sand. I believe they import their sand from Australia and dump it in certain areas. So at least in those areas, there's sandy beach. The rest of the coastline is like hard, sharp lava rock. So me and my buddies, we, went, we, would, we would go scuba diving. And one day we went out scuba diving. It's a gorgeous day. The ocean's blue. The sky is blue. We go to the water. We're standing on like this lava rock, and it's a jump into the water to go scuba diving. And that's cool. Uh, the, the waves are just super tranquil. We're having a great time. We like hop in. It's like getting into a bath, a nice warm bath. We just go right in. It's great. We go down. We're underwater for a while. We go. We're having a good time. We go do our business. It's great. We turn around to come back, and we don't realize, and maybe you guys realize, and maybe, maybe we'll see a little bit of it today because it's kind of decent outside right now, but we're supposed to get a little storm later on, right? 
Yeah, so, so sometimes in the water, like, them storms come out like that. Well, we didn't know under the water, like, we, we hopped in the water, and it was super peaceful and tranquil and cool, and while we're underwater, all of a sudden, a storm popped up. It was, it was all of a sudden, it was, it was just on top of the water, and we're still underwater, and we're heading back, and we're thinking everything's cool and stuff. We're going back to exactly where we had jumped in off the little lava rock. We're good to go. We're trying to come out that same place, and then we start to surface, and we're, like, from maybe here to the tech booth back there, and we surface for the first time, and all of a sudden, it's like, it's like absolutely everything has changed. It's blue sky, gone. Clouds all over the place. Water that was once calm is now super choppy. It's got all the white caps all over the place. And it's like, oh, shoot, what has happened? And then we, we keep going towards the rock. And before, before we realize it, we are actually getting to the rock. And we, we finally realize that the waves are now breaking. They're huge. And they're breaking right on that lava rock, right on that lava rock where we're trying to get out at. Well, it was too late to turn back. We didn't even know until we were there, and all of a sudden, like, the waves are hitting us, and they're dragging us up onto these lava rocks that we're trying to climb out on, and it's, like, flipping us around, scraping us along these, like, sharp rocks. We got the tanks on. I'm getting beat up. My legs is, like, all bloody. My arms is bloody. I'm, I'm, I'm like, trying to scramble up, and then it hits me again, and I'm getting, like, thrown all over the place, and there's a moment there that's, like, frozen in time in my mind. <laughs> it's, I, I look down as I'm, like, scrambling up these rocks, and I'm about to get hit by another wave, and, and the water pulls my ring off that I've only had for, like, two months. And it pulls it off, and I watch it roll down a lava rock a little bit under the water and disappear into, like, this big crack. And as it disappears into this crack and it's being pulled away, I get hit by another wave, and I'm scraped up the lava rock, roll my way out, and finally, like, escape. And I turn around, I'm like, oh, my ring! And as I turn around to go look to get my ring, I'm like, I want to get my ring! The waves, the waves are just monster. There's just no way. It's gone. So I make this drive home to my newlywed. <laughs> and we laugh about it now, right, babe? <laughs> but I walked in the door with, like, bloody legs and bloody arms, and I was like, babe, I lost my ring. What do I do? And she's like, you go back and you get it. <laughs> it's like, babe, you don't understand. Man. But in a way, you know, I'd lost something of tremendous value, and I wanted to go back and get it. And I believe that this is what the Lord did when he brought himself from on high and dove headlong into our storm to bring himself so low into our brokenness, into our sin, into our captivity, into our hurt and our wounds, to come low, to go and retrieve what was lost, to dive headlong into our brokenness. At great cost, he dove headlong into our storm to set the captives free, to make the blind be able to see, to bind up the brokenhearted. He jumped into it and came low, born so low that it was like baby in a feed trough low emptied of his divine privileges so he could walk along with us and call back to him that which was lost. Ephesians 4 says it like this. It's actually quoting a psalm here. It says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. And we break that down. It's really about Back in the day, like if you were a king and you were fighting against another kingdom, you would go in there and you'd capture their, their city and you'd steal all their stuff. You'd plunder all their wealth and then you'd take all the captives and you'd bind them up, sometimes put things through their nose and pull them by their noses and you'd bring them back in this long train back to your home city. And this was like the spoil and the plunder. You took all their gold and you even took their people. And this is the image that we get here. Except Christ came down. Let's go to that back one, for the last one for a second. Yep. Christ came down from on high. He conquered the grave and death, kicked over the kingdom of Satan, grabbed his people, rescued his people, and put them on his back and carried them with him, giving them gifts, not stealing from them, but giving them things they didn't even have and bringing them with him out of that darkness and into his marvelous light. Verse 9 goes on and says, what does it mean that he ascended except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions where we're at? The one who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. 
Christ came low to rescue the lowly. And the kicker is that actually, maybe we forget this sometimes, but the, the real kicker here is that we're the lowly. <laughs> we are. You see, I get myself in trouble. The times when I get myself in the most trouble is when I stop thinking I'm lowly. And I start thinking I got it all together. I start thinking I can do this in my own strength. Right? I can get up there. I can go like do a little song and dance, tell some jokes, tell a story to pull on some heart. I can't do that. Do you understand? I can't do it without the spirit of God. If he doesn't move, it's better that I die in my bed at home or something, man. I don't want to be up here just going through the motions without the spirit of God in this thing. I can't do it without him. And if we have that attitude, I think every single one of us, not that I always get it right because I often get it wrong. I often forget this stuff. And God needs to remind me with his humble and gentle hand, hey, buddy, you lean on your own understanding again. Hey, buddy, you're holding too tight onto your own plans again. Hey, buddy, you're picking up that unforgiveness again and you're holding it in your fists again. And his gentle humility. He's just taking it right back out of my hands and just like, trust me. Open your hands for me. Surrender to me. When I forget where I come from, when we get too comfortable and forget our need for him, when we get complacent, when Sundays is just checking a box and then we go on our merry way, that's where we get ourselves in trouble because without Christ, we can do nothing. Nothing. He brings the low high and the high low. The Bible says it. He humbles the proud and lifts up the humble. The Bible says that when he comes back, the mountains are going to melt like wax and the valleys will be lifted up. Brings the high low and the low high. It's a good place to be in when we consider ourselves lowly in his presence. The only way from there is up. So I think... This time of year, you know, it's tough. It's great and it's tough. It's like this bittersweet thing. It's like, it's like the beauty of, of Christmas and the story of Christ, but the, but the very real difficulties of life, right? Right? But the Lord is our hope. He's the light of the world. He's our hope. He is the one who gives us something that the world does not have. The world has no hope. I know so many people who are, who are going through life just terrified of dying because they think when they close their eyes, that's it. And they have all these questions and they have all this fear and they have, they're hopeless. But we have the hope of Christ. He's the light of the word. He's the anchor of our faith. He's the one that we look to. He's the one that we believe in. He's the light in our dark places. So whatever you're going through with brokenness or shame or sin or broken relationships, do you feel like a loser? Man, I was on the street. I was in programs with like a bunch of guys. We, we could barely even tie our own shoes. And God did what he did in my life. Like, what? why couldn't he do that for you? I meet people all the time. It's like, at this point, like the testimony that I have, it's, it's, it almost has nothing to do with me. I just, I just want to be obedient and just state that fact that if God would do it, for, not like I was worthy. It's not like I was, I was checking the right boxes. He just said, you, and he snatched me out of the fire. So why not you? Your plans haven't gone the way that you thought they would. The relationships are broken in a way that you did not expect. Maybe your health maybe your finances, maybe just who knows. But in this time of year, I want you to remember that our only hope is Christ and Christ is the hope of glory. Christ is the hope of glory. Meaning that, let's put that point up there. Yeah, Christ is the hope of glory. 
meaning that we look to him beyond what our eyes can see, beyond what our ears can hear, beyond what we see around us in this world, beyond the circumstances of life. We look to him as the hope of glory. We know that he came low to bring us with him. He came low to redeem us and restore us, to not leave us where he found us, but to heal us and bind us up and bring us, even if it's on his back, because we can't walk another step. We can't do it ourselves. And that's why in this Christmas season, we got all these like gifts under the tree. I got kids, we got kids, and it's like there's going to be some gifts under the tree. But even those gifts are just a symbol of the greatest gift of all. And if maybe we can just take a minute just to even imagine what it would be like that little baby God in the flesh, the word of God, the let there be light, word of God. Humbled himself, emptied himself completely to come to this earth to walk among us that he might find what was lost. And with all those generation upon generation of people who have in a way stood around that little manger and gazed on him year after year. Lord, we just thank you today, God, for your great, amazing humility, Lord, your great love and grace. We see you in this moment. We understand, at least in part, what you have done we don't feel worthy. Of course we don't feel worthy, Lord. We're not worthy, Lord. You're the one that makes us worthy, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for humbling yourself like that. We couldn't have done it without you. We cannot do it without you. We need your grace every day. For those of us in this room who are going through a season of brokenness, God, I pray right now, Lord, that you remind them that you are the healer, that you are the hope. You are the light of the world. I pray your comfort in their season right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Be reminded of the truth that you don't ever leave. You will never forsake. That you've actually called us the light of the world. And you've said that the darkness cannot overcome that light. God, you've put something in us, Lord, where the gates of hell will never, ever prevail because of who you are, Lord. Thank you, God. We pray for your strength in the mighty name of Jesus and that mighty spirit of God, your strength, Lord, in the people in this place, God, to walk and see you, Lord, and praise you, Lord, because you are the life giver. You're the light in the darkness, God. We see you. Help us. Love you more, God, in that mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The greatest gift of all. Sometimes I got to remind myself that as like a parent and I'm like running around struggling, like what's, what's the special gifts we're going to get our kids? And there's always like a pressure to like, it has to be bigger than the year before, right? It has to be more than X amount of gifts or whatever, man. And it just always kind of comes back to, I want to make sure that what they remember the legacy of their father and their mother is that we reminded them of what the greatest gift was. Because they're going to forget about iPads and iPhones. They're going to forget about the toys and the dolls. Even the animals are going to come and go. But the word of God lasts forever. Amen.